friends, today's webinar is uh, on airway management and uh, uniformity in diversity. Well, airway is something that uh, each one, any anesthetist of uh, any uh, level, any caliber, uh, whether he's a postgraduate student or he is a junior uh, consultant or a senior consultant, airway remains one of the most, I would say, sought for uh, subject of discussion uh, among the anesthesiologists. And for this uh, session today, for airway management, we have one of the masters who is so very well known uh, with regard to the airway. He is the founder of the uh, Airway Management Foundation uh, as well, uh, Professor Rakesh Kumar. And uh, Professor Rakesh Kumar is uh, currently the uh, teaching consultant there at Bhimrao uh, Ambedkar, Baba Sahib Ambedkar Medical College. And uh, he has uh, a special interest in teaching uh, and conducting particularly workshops uh, for airway management as well as for uh, uh, cardiopulmonary resuscitation. He is known for both these activities and he's been doing it for a uh, number of years uh, now. And uh, over to you, Dr. Keshmar, please. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Baljeet. Uh, it's a pleasure to hear uh, such lovely words from you. And uh, we know that uh, we were associated right from the beginning of our uh, journey. So I bring greetings to uh, the whole team of ICA and all the people who are uh, the participants today from our team of Every Management Foundation, uh, who's, uh, who has, as, as Dr. Bajit was telling you, it has completed 20 years of its, uh, uh, its uh, from in time of inception, 2003, we began at MAMC, but then we branched out as Airway Management Foundation. And in the last 20 years, we have been able to conduct more than or nearly 100 uh, workshops uh, in and around the country and around the world. These are the things that we have been doing for the last just few years. The thanks to the wonderful uh, kind of patients, difficult airway patients that we are exposed to and lucky to have uh, all kinds of equipment and more importantly, um, mannequins and simulators. But most important, uh, a team of very dedicated and passionate uh, instructors. And uh, uh, as uh, uh, Dr. Radha was getting, uh, was feeling proud about being able to can continue their webinars during uh, during the COVID time, we also remained active. Luckily, God has been kind. And even during the pandemic, we were able to conduct uh, a few uh, wonderful workshops, airway workshops. The last uh, uh, national level workshop we conducted at uh, Patna, which was in February this year. And very recently, just last, last week, thanks to uh, IPA, we, along with IPA, we conducted the second exclusive pediatric airway workshop. So uh, as far as today's presentation is concerned, um, uh, as is uh, very clearly written out here, that uh, it will be uh, the team of AMF, uh, four people who will be representing team AMF today along with me. They will be presenting a simple and uniform approach for managing different diverse sets of uh, airway management scenarios uh, which have been handed over to us by Dr. Radha Kishan. Uh, they are pretty uh, separate from each other. So we have uh, so we have uh, Dr. Nidhi Bhatia talking about airway management in a four term parturian to begin with, followed by uh, Dr. Munisha Agarwal. She'll be talking about airway management of a morbidly obese uh, patient. And then finally, then third one will be the airway management of a patient with C-spine instability by Dr. Nishant from Patna, as you had, in, uh, we'll introduce them as the as their talk begins. And uh, finally, a low birth weight syndromic baby uh, with deformed airway will be handled by Dr. Anju from Lady Harding uh, Medical College. So uh, we will be showing to you a, a, a uniform approach which will uh, revolve around knowing your patient, knowing your equipment and knowing your procedure. The slogan which uh, the SEED workshop of Airway Management Foundation has been using since 2017. And we have had wonderful results out of that. So I hand you over to uh, Dr. Nidhi to start her uh, talk. Thank you, Dr. Bajit. Uh, 
over to Dr. Nidhi. Thank you, sir. I'll stop um, sharing. Uh, yeah. Over. Nidhi, all yours. Thank you, sir. Is my screen visible? Yes, now it is. Yeah. So, so let me let yeah. uh, this the previous slide. Yes. So this is uh, her credentials. As already told, uh, she is professor and core faculty at uh, PGI MER Chandigarh and core faculty uh, for trauma anesthesia and acute care. Although she is also a very important member of the AOA. And that's why she is talking about the, the topic that we have chosen for her today. She has a number of publications, books, uh, editorial, edit, editorial, editor's job. And uh, she is a core member of uh, the team of AMF as well as uh, Lifesavers Association. And she's also into trauma instructorship. And she is national faculty for various national and regional conferences and resource faculty for various workshops. She is a she is a wonderful wonderful friend, uh, a, a a very passionate human being, very, very um, a lot of empathy and uh, a lot of team spirit. It's always a pleasure to work with her, and uh, you get always get the best out of her all the time. I'm sure it will be a great presentation. Over to you, Nidhi. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you for those kind words. It's a pleasure to be associated with you. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. a, a very good evening to all. It's really an honor to be a part of this esteemed platform. So coming on with the first presentation, I'll be talking about the airway management of a full-term parturient. Now as airway practitioners, we are all required to ensure oxygenation at all times, maintain ventilation and achieve a patent airway in that order. Achieving the same in a full-term parturient can be extremely challenging because of the multiple anatomical and physiological changes associated with pregnancy, Secondly, the time of delivery may be totally unpredictable as most of these patients can land up in surgery during emergency hours, requiring you to provide anesthesia on a most urgent basis. Thus, by going by literature, the frequency of difficult intubation and full-term parturients ranges from 0.3 to 3%, with the frequency of failed intubation being up to 0.4%. So it is very important that we all are aware of the changes which happen during pregnancy, the risk factors associated with difficult intubation and full-term parturients, and be aware of the urgency and the time of surgery. So like Sir mentioned, I'll be following a uniform approach to managing the airway of full-term parturient. I'll be first discussing how do we assess the patient, then assessing the non-patient factors, which includes knowing our equipment as well as the procedure. So the AMF has put forth the line of sight approach of detailed airway assessment of the patient so as to identify the likely areas of airway management difficulty. This mainly involves taking a focused history, a focused general physical examination, and a focused airway examination with or without the use of ultrasound or imaging. So when we come on to focused history, what is specific for a full-term parturient? One is, first and foremost, you should know that is the patient laboring? If the patient is laboring, is she in early or advanced stage of labor and has oxytocin been administered for augmentation? All this history is relevant because your airway swelling, which is common in pregnancy, may worsen with the antidiuretic effect of oxytocin and prolonged straining during labor. The malampati scores tend to be higher in laboring parturients and in advanced stages of labor, there is delay in gastric emptying. So all of these will increase your difficulty in laryngoscopy, intubation, and increase the risk of regurgitation and aspiration. Then it is important to know the history of comorbid obstetric problems, including gestational hypertension, eclampsia, preeclampsia with associated proteinuria and coagulopathy, because all of these, if present, can increase the risk of airway edema, lead to an enlarged and less mobile tongue, soft tissue deposition in the neck, leading to increase in neck circumference and exaggerated bleeding during laryngoscopy. All of these may make your mask ventilation, laryngoscopy, and intubation difficult. And depending upon the extent of comorbidities that are present, your SAD placement, that is a supraglottic airway device placement, as well as your surgical front of neck access may also become difficult. 
Then coming on to the focused general physical examination, we all know that during pregnancy, the lady may gain weight to the extent of 12 to 20 kg because of the increase in total body water, interstitial fluid, blood volume, uterine size, and enlargement of breasts. This increase in weight gain can reduce the chest compliance, create a short neck, large tongue, large breasts, and increase the risk of diabetes, hypertension, preeclampsia. All of these may again lead to difficult mask ventilation and laryngoscopy. Then the gravid uterus in a full term can lead to a shift in the position of the stomach, leading to a change in the angle of the gastroesophageal junction. Further, it leads to an increase in the level of the diaphragm, widens the AP and the transverse diameter of the chest, and widens the subcostal angle. All of these three things, they do not produce any much change in the vital capacity, but it does lead to a decrease in the functional residual capacity, mainly because of the decrease in the expiratory reserve volume. As a result of a decrease in this, the pregnant females are prone to rapid desaturation during periods of apnea, and because of the shift in the position of the gastroesophageal junction, they are at an increased risk of regurgitation and aspiration. Having said that, now what are the physiological and anatomic changes which are specific to pregnancy that can affect the airway? Coming on to the physiological changes first, the minute ventilation is increased with an increase in oxygen consumption to the tune of 30 to 60 percent. This, along with the decrease in the FRC and the expiratory reserve volume, can lead to rapid desaturation during periods of apnea, which is further exacerbated by elevated BMI and the supine position of the lady. Then a brief mention about the iota cable compression. In supine position, due to the gravid uterus, there is iota cable compression resulting in a decreased venous return and a decreased cardiac output. Because of the decreased cardiac output, there is a physiological dearrangement of the patient, which increases the risk of cardiovascular collapse during airway management. Thus, it indirectly leads to a physiologically difficult airway. So these physiological dearrangements should be kept in mind while managing the airway, even if there is no anatomic difficulty with intubation. Then the increased progesterone causes a smooth muscle relaxant effect on the GI mucosa and prolonged gastric emptying, resulting in increased risk of regurgitation and aspiration. Now, coming on to the anatomic changes, the most significant is there is a progressive increase in the Malampati score as the period of gestation progresses, as well as during labor. Thus, this highlights the importance of careful airway assessment evaluations prior to administration of GA in laboring patient, and you should not rely on pre-labor data because this increase in Malampati score leads to difficult laryngoscopy. Then, as mentioned, there is increased airway edema, tissue friability, and increase in neck circumference because of hormonal changes, increase in blood volume, comorbidities, use of oxytocin, and effect of Valsalva during second stage of labor. All of these may lead to difficult mask ventilation, laryngoscopy, intubation, as well as extubation or emergence. So having gone by the focused history, the general physical examination and the airway examination, the possible areas of difficulty which we commonly encounter in a full-term parturient are the difficulties in mask ventilation, laryngoscopy and intubation. And also if a lot of comorbidities like preeclampsia, eclampsia are present, you may face difficulty in inserting a supraglottic airway device. If there is a lot of edema around the neck, neck circumferences increase, air, invasive airway may be difficult to achieve and emergence can also be difficult. So we now know what are the difficulties which we may encounter after having a detailed assessment of the patient. This is a very good article which was published in 2022, which identified the risk factors for difficult laryngoscopy in a full-term parturient, which included a great a BMI of more than 40, increased Malapati score, small hyomental distance, weight gain, increased neck circumference, and presence of preeclampsia and eclampsia. So having identified the risk factors and the patient factors, it is now important to focus on the non-patient factors before we begin with managing the airway in a full-term parturient. The non-patient factors mainly include, we have to take a note of the resources which are available with us, which include, we need to see whether we have the available equipment, including the para-oxygenation equipment. We have enough knowledge and skills to deal with such difficult airways. 
We have an extra pair of hands, which come in quite handy, especially when these patients come to us in emergency scenarios. And we need to see whether we have ICU or HDU facilities if need be. The other non-patient factors which we need to keep in mind are what are the surgical requirements, whether the patient positioning has to is special or is there a sharing of airway. In a full-term patch orient, there is no special position. The patient is supine and there is no sharing of the airway. And we all know that airways can be at times managed in more than one way. So it is important to keep in mind what, your, what the airway manager is thinking, what is his or her mindset, and whether he has the requisite equipment and the knowledge and the skill for dealing with the same. The third important thing, which is very pertinent in cases of obstetrics or in full-term parturians is when does this patient come to you for airway management or for general anesthesia? Most frequently or most commonly, these patients come to you in emergency settings for emergency cesarean sections. And these cases are managed by residents whose knowledge and skills may at times may not be up to the par because they are residents dealing with emergency situations. And because it's an emergency setting, airway evaluation may be particularly hurried. And as a result, obstetric airway catastrophes occur most frequently during emergency settings. So these need to be kept in mind. So having dealt with the patient factors and the non-patient factors and identified the possible areas of difficulty, the next question is how do we manage these difficulties? The first and foremost is adequate preparation. Preparation is the key to success. You have to be prepared at all times. We in our labor suites encourage residents as soon as they go for the morning duties to go and take a labor room rounds so that they know which are the patients who are in labor, who have been induced, which are the potential patients who may come to you for a surgery and potentially difficult airways. So they are, so that they are prepared and have seen the airway and have discussed with their consultants and with the team. So communication and team discussion is of utmost importance. It is important to be prepared with the experienced help at hand and the essential and rescue equipment and availability of ICU if required. Your equipment should be there, what we require for managing the airway, especially a difficult airway. In addition, in the full-term parturient, it is important if the parturient is obese to have a ramping facility, have video laryngoscope with you. The endotracheal tubes of assorted sizes, especially smaller sizes, endotracheal tubes should be available. Second generation supraglottic airway devices, oral airways, bougies, flexible video endoscopes, and equipment for front of neck access. All of these, in addition to your standard preparation, should be there. Then because most of these patients are prone to uh, regurgitation and aspiration, fasting should be ensured. It can be ensured in elective cases. In these cases, clear liquids are allowed for two hours before induction. In laboring patients, especially those who are at high risk, solid foods should be avoided. They can be given clear liquids though. Aspiration prophylaxis should be timely administered. Then to optimize the patient position, a 20 to 30 degree head up tilt is very useful as it decreases the difficulty with the insertion of a laryngoscope, which is caused by large breasts. It improves the view at laryngoscopy and may reduce gastroesophageal reflux. In obese parturients, ramped position is greatly helpful. And like I said, always maintain a left uterine displacement till the baby is delivered. Another important thing, because these patients are prone to rapid desaturation, pre-oxygenation is of utmost importance to ensure an end tidal oxygen fraction of more than 90%. This you can give by giving tidal volume breaths for three minutes. In emergency scenarios, vital capacity breaths can be given over a period of 60 seconds or 30 seconds. And once you have pre-oxygenated, all these patients are induced to using a modified rapid sequence induction technique. While we are doing this, it is important at all times to maintain para-oxygenation, which we commonly do with the help of nasal cannula using 15 liters per minute of oxygen flow. So it is very important, all these maneuvers you can remember by this mnemonic, SU, that is while you are managing the airway in a full-term parturient, do a Celex maneuver, oxygenate, para-oxygenate, do a uterine displacement and give an aspiration prophylaxis. Optimize mask ventilation with proper positioning. You can use your two hands and an oropharyngeal airway when required. Laryngoscopy and intubation can be optimized by an optimal position, which we, we commonly use a head, uh, 
head tilt, 20 degree head uh, up position. The first attempt should be your best attempt at intubation. So we use video laryngoscope as a first line device for all tracheal intubation and use smaller size endotracheal tubes. If the first attempt at intubation fails, the priority always remains maintaining oxygenation. You need to communicate to the entire team and attempt face mask ventilation and oxygenation. Subsequent intubation attempts should be performed by experienced anesthesiologists using either different laryngoscope or blades, cessation of frequent pressure, external manipulations, and repositioning of head and neck. At no time do we attempt laryngoscopy for more than three times. If your intubation attempts fail, again, I emphasize the focus is to maintain oxygenation either via your face mask or a second generation supraglottic device, which is inserted if a face mask ventilation is difficult or it's an emergent surgery and you have to proceed. So once your second generation SAD is in place, you can proceed with surgery with the SAD, which we do and I have done in a couple of cases. If you feel your SAD is not in a good, as good position as you would have wanted it to be, you can do a fiber optic guided intubation through an SAD, which comes in very handy. In cases where the surgery is non-emergent, discuss with your surgeon and you can consider awakening the patient. What happens if your SAD placement fails? Final attempt we make with the rescue face marks ventilation using optimal technique. If there is a complete ventilation failure, it is serious demanding emergent management and the team should call for additional help immediately so as to achieve a surgical access. Now, emergence is as important as induction, and you need to plan and prepare your emergence in these patients and should only be performed when the woman is fully awake, responsive, maintaining saturation, and generating a satisfactory tidal volume. So having looked at how to look, uh, see the airway of a term parturient, let us use the same F approach in this patient. A 30-year-old severely preeclamptic full-term parturient is blocked to the operating room of a well-equipped tertiary care hospital for emergency cesarean delivery due to non-reassuring fetal heart rate. Her enzymes are elevated, platelet count is decreased, she is obese with a malampati grade 3. So having seen this history and examination, we know that our areas of concern in this is we may have a difficult mask ventilation, difficult laryngoscopy and in intubation, and our emergence may be difficult because the patient is severely preeclamptic, high grade malampati, and she is obese with a low platelet count. The patient we have, since we are in a tertiary care institute, we have all the equipment and fallback capabilities. However, the patient has come to us for an emergency section. So the knowledge and skills and the extra hand availability may be questionable in emergency scenarios. So how do we manage these? In such situations, it is important that you call for expert help early and an extra pair of hands. Mask ventilation can be optimized with optimum position. In this case, ramped position because she's a piece. Use a nasopharyngeal airway. Laryngoscopy intubation can be optimized with a ramped position. Pre-oxygenation, para-oxygenation has to be maintained at all times. First attempt with a video laryngoscope, use a small size endotracheal tube and emergence when the patient is fully awake. And at all times during induction, please remember soup. That is your Celex maneuver, oxygenation, para-oxygenation, uterine tilt and aspiration profile excess. So to conclude, airway management of a full-term parturient is laden with clinical challenges. It is important to be aware of the anatomical and the physiological changes that happen during pregnancy and be aware of the situational aspects of provision of anesthesia because these are very different and most of these patients come to us in emergency. Follow the AMF line of sight method for airway assessment. It is very useful, simple, mm -hmm. and answers a lot of your questions. And in addition to patient, assess the non-patient factors and planning and preparation is key to success. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Dr. Nidhi. That was very nice and uh, fluent. And it covered uh, all the aspects, I thought. So well done. And uh, the second, uh, I, uh, I request Dr. Monisha to yes. start uh, so that we can introduce her to the audience. Uh, slideshow, yeah. So as already introduced, Dr. Monisha is a friend for a long, long time and a core member of our uh, 
to families, the Airway Management Foundation and Lifesavers Association. And uh, presently, she is Director Professor at Malana Azad Medical College and Lok Nayak Hospital. And we have been uh, together ever since we started our uh, journey into the uh, airway management. And her areas of interest, you can all see. Fibroscopy, uh, she was the one who took the first presentation in 2004 and has been doing it ever since. So fibroscopy and difficult airway management, BLS and ACLS. Pediatrics is another area of her choice. Pediatrics she has done for a very, very long time. Teaching and training is her passion. And uh, lately, uh, you know, she has, uh, I, thanks to COVID, we have, all become, uh, we have all got oxygenated very well. And uh, she has got, gotten into medical oxygen infrastructure, logistics, and management. I think we will have to hear more from her on that uh, also. So over to Dr. Munisha. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir, for those kind words. Uh, now we uh, uh, discuss about airway management of a morbidly obese patient. The National Audit Program number four of UK was one of the largest studies regarding the major complications of airway management <clears throat> ever performed. <clears throat> and the pertinent points uh, regarding the airway management in obese patients, those were noted were, there was a lack of recognition and planning for potentially airway problems. The safe apnea PM is decreased and hence, whenever the airway complications occur, they do so very rapidly and may prove to be catastrophic. Rescue techniques like use of supraglottic devices and emergency tricot hydrotomy had an increased failure rate and adverse respiratory events were more seen if the anesthetist was inexperienced. So uh, what is so uh, different about morbidly mm. obese patients that makes their airway management apparently so difficult? The WHO has uh, classified this uh, population into various classes one, two, and three based on their uh, BMI. Uh, the BMI of 30 to 34.99 being the class one. Then we have morbid obesity of uh, BMI more than 35 with concomitant obesity associated diseases. Similarly, super obese has been defined as BMI more than 50. However, BMI or absolute weight are poor predictors of difficult intubation. So how do we manage these patients as far as their airway uh, management is concerned? Again, we follow the uniform approach as advocated by the AMF. First, knowing your patient, what are the features specific to your obese patients which can affect your airway management? Then we go on to the equipment required to uh, deal with the airway of these patients and then implementation of the required procedure. So the anatomical changes affecting the airway management in the obese patient uh, range from deposition of excess fatty tissue externally on the breast, neck, thoracic wall, and the abdomen, and internally in the mouth, pharynx, and abdomen, making the airway management at every level, right from mass ventilation till the uh, front of neck excess, difficult. The physiological changes, reduced FRC, atelectasis, increased basal oxygen consumption, decreased lung and chest wall mm -hmm. compliance, all cause them to desaturate very rapidly during short periods of apnea. Moreover, supine posture, induction of general anesthesia, pneumoperitoneum are the additional factors which uh, exaggerate these problems. So it is very important that you pre and para oxygenate these patients while managing their airway. Also, it has been seen that these patients have increased propensity of upper airway collapsibility as seen during CT scans, lateral cephalometry, and drug-induced sleep endoscopy, which shows there is a decrease in the posterior airway space, increase in soft palate thickness and length, larger, longer tongue, and more anteriorly and inferiorly placed hyoid bone. The incidence of difficult intubation in morbidly obese is as high as 15%. 2.2% as compared to 2.2% in lean patients. And the specific indicators of difficult intubation in these patients are neck circumference more than 40 centimeters, MP class more than three, TMD of less than six, restricted mouth opening and TM joint mobility, male gender, short neck, and history of obstructive sleep apnea. So again, the AMF approach, first we know our patient, what we are dealing with and identify the features related to the patient 
which can make his or her airway management difficult. So coming, how do we do that? We take a focused history, especially the use of stop bank uh, scoring, which helps us to screen patients having sleep disordered breathing, that is obstructive sleep apnea or obesity hypoventilation syndrome. So does the patient have history of snoring, tiredness, daytime somnolence, observed apneic episode? Does the patient have history of high blood pressure, BMI more than 35, age more than 50 years, neck circumference more than 43 centimeters in males and 41 in females, male gender. And if the score is equal to or greater than five, it denotes significant sleep disordered breathing. Then continuing with the focus history, you must ask history of cough, dyspnea, symptoms related to URI. What posture does patient prefer while sleeping? Is his sleep disturbed? Has the patient undergone any airway corrective surgery? Like patients of OSA many times undergo uveloplato uh, palatoplasties. Any prior weight reduction surgeries like gastric banding, bypass or sleevectomy, which warrants uh, RSI uh, induction. Then history of diabetes with special emphasis on stiff joint syndrome, which may affect your atlanto-occipital joint, making neck movements difficult. Then very important history suggestive of gastroesophageal reflux disease, any cervical spine surgery, trauma, neck irradiation, or history of tobacco chewing, rheumatoid arthritis, or ankylosing spondylitis, all these affect your airway management. So after the focused history, we come to focused airway examination and focused general physical examination, starting from your uh, nostrils, mouth opening, MP class, neck movements, TM joint mobility, neck circumference, presence of short neck, cervical part of fat, PMD, submandibular compliance, identification of picothyroid membrane, and then focus general physical examination. So after having done your uh, focused air examination, taking focused history, now you'll be able to identify the nature of a uh, problem as far as airway management in morbidly obese patient is concerned, right from his cooperation and consent till your front of neck excess and extubation procedures. We must need to identify the areas of concern. So again, we follow the uniform approach advocated by mm -hmm. the uh, AMF. After having known your patient uh, uh, features, we now uh, go on to the uh, specific equipment required to deal with these patients. Besides the usual things which are done for preoperative pre uh, preparation, you must have uh, uh, emphasis on aspiration prophylaxis, especially if patient has history suggestive of GRD, uh, difficult airway. Uh, all the patients who are at risk of pulmonary aspiration must be administered aspiration prophylaxis. Regarding anxiolysis, you can avoid anxiolysis uh, in patients, especially if they have history of OSA, as they have increased propensity of uh, upper airway collapse. Then this position known as the ramp position is the most optimum position for managing the airway of a morbidly obese patient. And the clinical endpoint of this position is the horizontal line between the external auditory meatus to the sternal notch. How do you achieve this position? You can start stacking pillows and bed sheets right from under the patient's shoulder and go till the occiput of the patient. And you bring the external auditory meatus and the sternal notch in one horizontal line. You can also use a troop elevation pillow, a ready-made troop elevation pillow, which helps again to serve the uh, same purpose, putting the patient into a, a ramping uh, posture. What are the benefits of ramp position in morbidly obese patient? Not only it improves your ventilation and oxygen reserves, it improves the laryngoscopic view and also better appreciation of landmarks for application of required pressure and that of glycothyroid membrane. So while anesthesia induction, it is very important because they have uh, decreased safe apnea time that you must pre-oxygenate your patient with 100% uh, oxygen along with seven to 10 centimeters of CPAP and in head up position. So here you can see patient being pre-oxygenated with face mask and CPAP being uh, used. You ask the patient to do tidal breathing for three minutes 
uh, and achieve the clinical endpoint of adequate P oxygenation will be FeO2 of more than 0.9. So in regarding bag and mask ventilation in morbidly obese, it is usually seen that majority of the time it is bag and mask ventilation, which is difficult more than the intubation part. And the causes of difficult mask ventilation being decreased chest wall compliance, redundant fold of oropharyngeal tissues, and the fact that mandibular advancement does not increase the retropalatal and the retropharyngeal space in morbidly obese patient as compared to lean patients. And moreover, these patients desaturate to 90% within three minutes. And there is a strong negative linear correlation between time to desaturate and obesity. Morbidly obese patients with BMI more than 60 desaturate within one minute, allowing only one intubation attempt, requiring resumption of mask ventilation. So very important, the ability to mask ventilate morbidly obese patient is of utmost importance. Uh, after failed intubation attempt. So various indicators of mask, uh, difficult mask ventilation have been educated, like the increased BMI, age more than 49 years, short neck, neck circumference more than 40 centimeters, presence of history of snoring or OSA. So we usually use two hand or four hand mask ventilation. And one should have lower threshold of use of airway agents like oropharyngeal airway, and supraglottic devices so that it avoids gastric encephalation and creating uh, more problems during airway management. Here again, you see uh, forehand mask ventilation. What are the advantages of use of supraglottic devices in morbidly obese? They can be used for initial mask ventilation during induction of anesthesia when your mask ventilation is proving to be difficult. It improves oxygenation, mm -hmm. provides effective PEEP, and it also allows the uh, gastric decompression and you can use it as a conduit for intubation. Regarding laryngoscopy and intubation in morbidly obese patient, as uh, emphasized earlier also, because their safe apnea time is reduced. So your first attempt should be the best attempt. And how can we make it as the best attempt? You pre and para oxygenate your patient, put the patient in the optimum position that is the ramp. Patients with heavy breast, you need to retract the breast or you can use a short handle laryngoscope. If the cervical part of fat is, uh, fat is present, uh, limiting your neck extension, it is better to use video laryngoscope directly for your first attempt. So in, uh, uh, in short, you must choose the most appropriate airway device and prepare your patient accordingly. And you should ensure that expertise for use of that equipment is available and you must be ready for a backup plan for oxygenation. So here you can see laryngoscopy being done. You can see the patient has been placed properly in a ramp position and for paraoxygenation, bionasal cannulas are being used. Retraction of the breast, if the uh, handle of the laryngoscope is obstruct, uh, getting, uh, I mean, you are having difficulty in inserting in the mouth. Presence of cervical part of fat limiting the neck extension, directly use video laryngoscope for your first attempt for laryngoscopy. Use of CMAC video laryngoscope and nasal prongs for paraoxygenation. Then you can use devices like air track. Then nasopharyngeal airway is a very good method for paraoxygenating your patient during uh, airway management. Here you can see NPA connected to the breathing circuit, maintaining oxygenation. And through the other nostril, you can easily do other airway intervention like fiber optic guided uh, intubation. You can use nasal prongs for paroxygenation and do oral or nasal fiber optic uh, bronchoscopy. Then you can even use uh, high flow nasal oxygen cannula for paroxygenation during your intubation. For example, during oral fiber optic guided intubation. You can use an endoscopy mask for maintaining your oxygenation and ventilation during your uh, intubation. For example, this diaphragm gets opened up and you can insert your uh, fibroscope loaded with the tube to perform your fibroscopic guided intubation. All these techniques are aiming towards maintaining oxygenation during airway management. Then coming to extubation, the DAS 2012 extubation guidelines have uh, described extubation process in morbidly obese patient as at 
at risk extubation. So first of all, you must assess whether it is safe to remove the endotracheal tube or not. Then you must always do an awake extubation. And the position, ideal position is you make, patient should be in sit-up posture. Always pre-oxygenate your patient to achieve an end tidal of uh, oxygen concentration of greater than 0.9. Ensure adequate reversal of neuromuscular uh, blockade. Patient should be conscious, obeying commands, and then you extubate the patient and followed by administration of oxygen with or without CPAP. And patients who have history suggestive of OSA, it is a very good idea to insert a well-lubricated, appropriately sized nasopharyngeal airway in a decongested nasal cavity before extubation because these patients have increased propensity of upper airway collapse. So insertion of NPA will avoid that collapse and uh, any uh, you know, interruption in oxygenation post extubation. So here you can see the position of the patient at the time of extubation. We are oxygenating the uh, patient post extubation. This is the oxygenation post extubation. Then you can even use nasal CPAP uh, post operatively for your patients. So uh, way back in the uh, 2010, we started a bariatric surgery uh, program at uh, Lok Naik Hospital. And the initial 50 cases that we did, only one patient I needed to do an awake fiber optic intubation. Patient's BMI was 51. He weighed 180 kilos with a neck circumference of 49 centimeter and snoring history was positive. And uh, after uh, anesthetizing the patient, when I did laryngoscopy and saw his seal rate, it was one. Then among these 50 patients, 20 patients had difficult mass ventilation. And uh, one of these patients whose weight was 171 kilos with BMI of nearly 55, we needed to do uh, six hand and use of OPA for difficult mass ventilation. And patient was intubated in the first attempt using a video laryngoscope. And though the uh, uh, CL grade with Macintosh laryngoscope was three. So what I am just highlighting, it is majority of the patient, it is the mass ventilation, which is more difficult than the intubation. So coming to this case, this lady, obese class three with a BMI of nearly 58, MP class four with adequate mouth opening, short neck, short TMD, decreased neck uh, extension with a stop bank uh, score of five. How did we manage her? Then again, the using the AMF, uh, AMF uh, grip, after having taken a focus history and focused examination, we found that the areas of concern, the consent and cooperation were good enough. However, the patient insisted that she is most comfortable in sitting posture while sleeping and otherwise also. So, and all these other areas were probably uh, difficult. So how did we manage this case? This patient was, the airway was managed by doing an awake nasal fiber optic guided intubation with patient in the sitting posture. And uh, you can see the patient was pre uh, para oxygenated uh, by putting an NPA in one nostril connected to the oxygen store. And the intubator was standing in, uh, you know, by the side of the OT table facing the patient. So that is a, uh, one of the very uh, useful methods, assuring method, which I use for doing awake fiber optic uh, intubation in morbidly obese uh, patients. So to conclude, a robust airway management strategy must be planned and discussed in all mor morbidly obese patients as the safe apnea time is reduced and there is faster desaturation and probable catastrophic results. So pre-oxygenation and para-oxygenation before and during intubation and extubation is of utmost importance. So we must plan our procedure and equipment accordingly one must ensure expert help and backup plan for oxygenation in all these patients. Propped up posture, peri-extubation oxygenation, use of nasopharyngeal airway and CPEP are integral parts of safe extubation in morbidly obese patients. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Monisha. Again, uh, beautifully covered. Uh, I hope uh, all, all of us 
uh, all the participants would have known that uh, they, we have discussed two cases and uh, by knowing our patients, we know which area we can have difficulty in and uh, then we search for them in a, in a standardized manner and try to manage them by special uh, skill set uh, like, uh, like Dr. Manisha told, talked about uh, facing the patient and then doing uh, awake fiber optic intubation, very unique, but very calming for the patient and uh, uh, taking care of a number of issues which are there in this patient. So let us, and both the ladies, uh, both our speakers have uh, told you again and again about oxygenation and both the group of patients were such that they would desaturate very quickly. So uh, now let us see what is there in store in the third presentation. I request Dr. Nishan Sahai to please uh, uh, begin his presentation in a C-spine, unstable C-spine case. Nishan. <clears throat> so I have the privilege of introducing him uh, to you. Uh, uh, a young, uh, the youngest of the four speakers uh, or the five speakers, if you consider me a speaker as well. Uh, he is additional professor at Ames Patna. He was the uh, organizing secretary of our last national level conference of Airman Management Foundation. Uh, a very good team person and uh, uh, has is, is very well connected with uh, publications and research methodology Medical education is his uh, field of interest along with airway management. And uh, uh, he has had uh, wonderful uh, outcomes in terms of uh, his postgraduates doing, uh, getting the best paper award. And he himself also being certified as certificate of excellence for quality reviewing of IJ in 2021. Uh, Nishant, over yeah. to you. Uh, thank you so much, sir. And uh, it is an absolute uh, pleasure to be able to share screen space with uh, uh, such stalwarts and uh, absolutely my teachers. I'm, uh, I hope I'm audible, sir. Uh, yes, very much. Perfect. So uh, the topic for me was uh, airway management of a patient with cervical spine instability. And uh, as per the AMF uh, uh, tenets, we have to know our patient, we have to know our equipment, and we have to know our procedure. That is uh, what is the crux of the teaching of AMF. And uh, yes, yeah, so for the cervical spine patient, how many of us know this patient? Well, it is he's not uh, obviously so obese to interest Dr. Manisha today, or obviously a pregnant lady that would interest Dr. Nidhi Bhatia, ma'am. Unfortunately, many people will say he's Rishabh Pant. Rishabh Pant as a name uh, will not have any uh, anesthetic significance per se, and that is the same with cervical spine. Many of these cervical spine injuries are uh, not too obvious uh, to the outside, and a focused clinical examination and focused history, and it uh, is very important to uh, certain the importance of the injury that these patients and the uh, importance of the maneuvers that we are going uh, to do on him is important. So uh, just a very uh, quickly, uh, what is important in cervical spine injuries is that we should know the anatomy. Now, this is the spinal, uh, uh, the vertebral canal, which is occupied by the odontoid process of the dense. And one third of it is occupied by the dense, one third is occupied by the spinal canal, uh, spinal cord, and one third is available. We understand the importance in cervical uh, trauma but there are certain cases in which the cervical spine is instable. And these like, for example, is the um, uh, patients with rheumatoid arthritis. Now what happens with rheumatoid arthritis is because of the instability of the ligaments, this dense, this part, uh, this is the dense. Yeah, this, this becomes unstable. If it moves by 3.5 millimeter, it is considered unstable. And if in a patient with uh, rheumatoid arthritis, one ligament goes, this dense moves by five millimeter. And if all the ligaments are damaged, then it can move by 10 millimeter. So we need to understand that uh, cervical spine instability can be non-traumatic. And uh, in patients of rheumatoid arthritis, if, a patient, if the odontoid process is displaced and we position him in a prone position with a displaced dense, then there are reports in which permanent quadriplegia has also occurred after surgery. 
regarding the traumatic portions, the cervical spine is divided into basically two portions, which is anterior to the posterior lig longitudinal ligament and those which are anterior to it. So the posterior portions, these portions, the posterior part houses the spinal canal. And if there is damage to the posterior portions, that is considered more unstable. So in a hyperextended injury, this, these portions of the uh, cervical canal in the posterior injuries will be more troublesome for the airway manager because then these areas will be very unstable and hyperextension injuries. Hyperextension injuries cause not only the damage to the anterior portions, but also the posterior portions. And thus, it is also uh, important to know that in, if hyperextension injuries, if the posterior portions are damaged, then the chances of uh, cervical spine instability and even with uh, trivial uh, uh, trauma, there can be catastrophic post-operative complications. So again, as per the AMF uh, protocols, we have to look for a focused history to note conditions which may have a bearing on airway management, a focused general physical examination, and uh, the airway examination, focused airway examination as per the line of sight method. Now, imaging in uh, cervical spine injuries is very controversial. And mostly when we are there inside the operating rooms, these imagings are available to us in the form of CT, MRI, or uh, even X-rays. But X-ray for a fresh uh, injury is not uh, actually very useful because in 25% of the patients, a simple lateral X-ray will not pick up the uh, injuries of the cervical spine. Three view X-rays are normally recommended, but in any case, we have to consider all cervical spines to be unstable. And uh, if our one finger is burnt or four fingers are burnt, we have to be careful of the fire. So regarding the focused history, uh, as I mentioned, the energy of the accident will determine the instability of the spine. If the forces are high, the motor vehicle accident at a certain speed, fall from a great height, these can cause uh, very unstable cervical spines. Mechanism of accident, hyperextension injuries also can cause uh, a very unstable cervical spines. And the other issue is the presence of conditions of comorbidities. Now, as I mentioned, ankylosing spondylitis is another spondylitis which has a lot of bearing, we all know. And we have seen that uh, in an undiagnosed ankylosing spondylitis can result in catastrophic uh, cervical spine injury at the time of intubations. The rheumatoid arthritis, as I mentioned, also can be very uh, difficult or dangerous because of the ligamentous changes down syndrome and various other syndromes like uh, all the mentioned ones can result in, a, in an unstable cervical spine and a focused history because if, if these conditions are liable to cause those cervical instability, they will have been showing some other systemic features which should, we should be careful about. Diabetes also is a condition uh, which we should be careful about. So coming to the focused uh, general examination. Now, many of the patients that will come to us might be having all these braces and uh, uh, the collars with the rigid board and uh, the sandbags with the tapes in the focal. For us, what is important is these might be very unstable cervical spines. We have to assess what are the, uh, what are the options available to us in terms of mouth opening. If there is a mouth opening which is uh, being severely limited by, by these braces, then we might have to work on the braces. Uh, to remove the anterior part of the semi-rigid collar. Maybe we have to assess for the uh, places where if, if needed, cricothyrotomy can be done. And uh, we have to devise methods and me means of ma managing or securing the airway uh, in these patients in minimizing any cervical spine movement. Again, this is the uh, various type of braces and sometimes these may be difficult to remove uh, uh, for the airway manager at the time of uh, intubation. A focused general examiner, uh, apart from that, we have to look for the presence and symmetry of any voluntary and involuntary movements and evidence of severe spinal cord injuries such as priapism or any abnormal breathing patterns. Another important aspect is that we have to document every sensory deficit. And this is important because in the post-operative period uh, after intubation, the sensory deficit might be uh, increased or changed. So a sensory deficit and uh, a motor and reflex deficit also has to be uh, adequately documented. 
Coming to the focused airway examination, the line of sight method, the, uh, we do the focused uh, air, line of sight airway examination for special airway management related features of the patient group and areas of concern can then be estimated by this. So for a cervical spine patient, as in any other, cervical, uh, any other patient, this patient might be an inherently difficult airway per se also. For a focused airway examination, we have to look at all the aspects in the line of sight, the nose, the malar regions, the cheek, we, the obvious features will be seen in the general examination. But if there is rhinorrhea or there is evidence of CSF rhinorrhea, then we'll be uh, careful regarding nasopharyngeal airway placement, the teeth, the dentalus, and we all know that the head neck range of movement is reduced in all these patients. So the various areas of concerns can be mask ventilation, supraglottic airway placement, and uh, laryngoscopy and intubation. Based on uh, the focus history and general phys uh, physical examination and the line of sight airway examination, there are certain uh, areas of concern which may be possible, impossible, difficult. Uh, these can be ascertained. So based on the mentation of the patient, the cooperation can be possible. It may be impossible or difficult. Mass ventilation has been shown to result in the maximum displacement of the cervical spines. And thus, mass ventilation, because we don't want any movement of the cervical spine, could be difficult. Supraglottic device placement has shown to have the least movement of the cervical spines. And uh, laryngoscopy and intubation obviously can be difficult because we do not want any movement. Invasive airway, tracheostomy, they are also difficult because they have shown to uh, improve or they, uh, change the cervical spine um, movement. They can be movement of the cervical spine. So there are various issues and there are various airway problems which are generated. Optended patient cooperation is a problem. As we see, they have braces, collars, head holders. All these uh, can be a problem. Mass ventilation, supraglottic, airway devices, even front of neck. Restriction of motion is desired at all times. Many of these patients of cervical spine injury come with uh, features. At least 25% of them have raised intracranial pressures also, especially in the acute period. So a smooth airway access and emergence is important for these patients. Uh, these patients, again, positioning because they'll be positioned in the prone position. If we are managing the cervical spine and there has been a displacement, probably will not be able to see it. And if they are lying prone for long durations, as I mentioned, there was a case report in which a lady was uh, having uh, permanent quadriplegia uh, after surgery could be directly or indirectly attributed to airway management. That, uh, that uh, is a matter of debate. So uh, equipment, uh, there are non-patient factors which are there. The equipment, the resources, and the surgical requirement, as in the case of if any other uh, surgery, we have to be familiar with the equipment and the resources. And here, there is the airway manager's mindset. Now, what is the airway manager's mindset? Is intubation a must? That should be the first question. And according to various guidelines, in a traumatic cervical spine injury, uh, all patients must be intubated. However, if there is a cervical spine instability, which is non-traumatic, uh, there are no guidelines. And again, personally, I believe if there is a supraglottic airway device, which is available and which causes less cervical spine movement, and if we can use it as a definitive airway management tool for surgeries which are not related to the cervical spine, then probably uh, I think uh, I'd be choosing the supraglottic device over uh, intubation in such patients. There are resources, equipment, as uh, we all know, and there are surgical requirements. In special, again, is the patient positioning. Patient positioning for cervical spine could be prone, and there are pins which can be attached. And in, after securement of the airway, the access of the airway is also uh, 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 compromised and a faulty access or faulty airway or displacement can be catastrophic. So there are various uh, techniques and devices which can help us to manage the various concerns that we have fo found on focused clinical examination and airway examination. Cervical spine integrity is paramount and there are uh, different techniques. We use the MILS or the manual inline stabilization. 
and manual inclined stabilization is basically done by two types in the first method the assistant approaches the head from the thorax end and rest it, uh, rests his hair of uh, forearms on the upper chest and clavicle and passes the wrists and hands up alongside the neck bilaterally now this method has been described by benumov and uh, and there are certain uh, caveats and there are certain things that we should note many times the ergonomics can be uh, may be disturbed because of the uh, presence of two people operating at uh, two different points then uh, we have to introduce the laryngoscope maybe in a such a way that uh, it does not interfere in the uh, with the person giving the mills uh, again we cannot make um, cause much much of extension of the head so we have to go with the scissoring technique the other method is when the assistant crouches below the operating table usually from the right side of the assistant and the uh, airway manager has to manage the airway accordingly so this permits the assistant to mobilize both the head and neck and also the important aspect of the operator or the assistant who is doing mills is to Uh, informing that he has perceived some movement so uh, again there are certain points which we should note if the patient is awake and uh, uh, and cooperative the alignment or the neutral position head position we can ask the patient to actively move into the uh, uh, head and neck into the neutral position but if the patient is unconscious or uncooperative unable to cooperate and if if the movement has been done passively by the laryngo uh, by the anesthesiologist if there is any pain or any neurological deficit uh, deterioration we should abandon it immediately in an unconscious patient if we find any resistance to any movement we should abandon the procedure and stabilize the neck in whatever position we have it there again a neutral head position is that position in which the spine maximizes the spinal canal diameter which is very important because there is a term called sac spinal uh, space available for the spinal canal that should be maximal and it corresponds to the normal anatomical position of the head and torso so that one assumes when standing and looking straight ahead these can be obtained in a variety of manners and for adults we don't want extension so we can put a small pillow to prevent head extension in children sometimes no pillows are put or sometimes we might need to create a hollow also to accommodate and in infants we need to put one or two folded towels under the trunk so we need to remove increase the uh, weight of i mean the height of the uh, trunk because of the increased uh, head size in such uh, small children mask ventilation is a difficult thing because it has been shown to cause a lot of cervical spine movement so there are various maneuvers uh, which we can use during mask ventilation we have to apply mills and we should have a very uh, small threshold for uh, uh, putting uh, adjuncts like oropharyngeal airway or the nasopharyngeal airway or even the supraglottic airway device there's the, the the thing that we can do the airway maneuver that we can do is jaw thrust but there should not be any chin lift or uh, head tilt or chin lift it, it has to be jaw thrust and uh, these will can improve the mask ventilation we can use adjuncts as i mentioned uh supraglottic airway devices can be used and should be used when mass ventilation is difficult similarly laryngoscopy and intubation will be difficult in these patients because uh, extension is limited we do not want any movement especially with the application of mills or the cervical collars uh the view of the cormac lee hand reading is uh, very much decreased in any case the target uh, that we should have is we should not be targeting a cormac lee hand one because during laryngoscopy the most common or the maximum cervical spine movement does not occur at the time of introduction of the blade or during the time of intubation it occurs at the time of lifting of the epiglottis so a video laryngoscope has always uniformly in all uh, most of the studies shown to improve the first pass success as well as uh, de decreases the spinal movement at the cervical spine as compared to a normal laryngoscope so a video laryngoscope should be the first device for the first scopy and in these cases a, a hyperangulated or, or a channeled a video laryngoscope may be used with the hyperangulated d blades uh, we have to use a special uh, we have to use the uh, stilets which is mandatory but 
compared to the stillet or the uh, uh, compared to the stillet the buji can intubate a uh, patient faster with a video laryngoscope especially when extension is limited so buji can be resorted to as the first uh, first device for intubation aid and again the aim for uh, cormac lehan grading should be 2a or 2b some people recommend 3a also with a stillet or buji we should not aim for a cormac lehan 1 because that will cause uh, injury to the cervical spine uh, a flexible video endoscope is also a very popular method of uh, intubating a patient with cervical spine injuries and uh, routine intubations in the absence of video laryngoscopes many pe people do it and jaw thrust is the opening maneuver which should be done in these patients uh, however using a supraglottic airway device with a flexible video endoscope guided intubation is also a very uh, good method to intubate these patients because supraglottic airway devices do not uh, allow much of uh, cervical spine movement and this is a video that was uh, that was recorded some time back in which uh, there are few things to note this is a supraglottic airway device aided intubation that is uh, being done and the supraglottic airway device needs to be pre shaped because for a pre shaped supraglottic airway device a neutral head position will suffice and once adequate uh, uh, good placement is confirmed then this supraglottic airway device may be used as a conduit for intubation in this video uh, because it was uh, slightly take, uh, old what is done is with the intubating uh, lma a blind endotracheal intubation has been done however in recent times uh, fiber optic uh, guided intubation is recommended even with uh, supraglottic airway devices there are uh, a variety of supraglottic devices now which are preformed and which can be used for the purpose very very easily and again as munisha ma'am has mentioned also uh, assessment using from the front is useful in these cases the supraglottic devices was placed from the front emergence is the final part of the talk emergence it needs to be smooth and if there is a, if there is fear that there will be a rocky emergence we can go in with the bailey's maneuver using a supraglottic device sometimes extubation is deferred if there has been extensive surgical manipulation and if there has been major damage already done uh before the surgery tracheostomy can also be planned uh, after emergence so uh, i thank you for your patient uh, listening uh, over to ranju ma'am thank you very much uh, dr nishant uh, this uh, was quite elaborate and uh, talked about a number of uh, special equipment and about special uh, skills that one need to have to manage a patient with c spine instability now let us have the last talk by uh, dr ranju dr ranju would you like to share your screen yes sir yes so as already spoken about by dr bajit in the beginning um she is director professor at uh, the previous slide please dr anju previous slide please dear yeah. she is director professor at lady harding medical college and associated hospitals and uh, she has the area of interest are obstetric pediatric anesthesia life support airway management i know of she has not written uh, she just conducted as i told you the ipa um uh, and amf uh, uh, joint uh, for second uh, exclusive pediatric airway uh, seed workshop uh, in delhi and uh, a great team person and a born leader and a glamorous lady uh, the the uh, steals the show wherever she goes and i'm sure she will do it here too and uh, many awards to her uh, in her kitty and a lot of publications uh, and um, uh, also uh, 
ensuring that women are in the forefront of every uh, sphere they are. So over to Dr. Ranju to um, deliver her talk. Very good evening to everyone and a heartfelt gratitude to the faculty from ICA and of course Rakesh sir to give us this opportunity to share our thoughts on topics which are so close to our heart. I being the last batswoman, uh, there are pros and cons. Things have become really simple because we've been re-emphasizing the AMF way of dealing with the airway. But I have big shoes to fill after such elaborate and wonderful talks. So like the children I'm talking about, I like to keep it really short, sweet and small and uh, probably really practical dealing on the difficult airway which I have encountered in so many years of my pediatric anesthesia practice. So uh, we've already done this, that we're going to focus on the patient equipment and procedure as we move along. So when we talk about neonate, particularly one who is syndromic and low birth weight and has an associated airway problems, what are the patient-related factors that we're really interested in knowing? It's a known fact that children, neonates in particular, have airways which are different from adults. The head is larger, the tongue is larger, the epiglottis is much larger, longer, as well as stiffer, oh, no, larynx is oh, much no, anterior no, and no, higher, and all these anatomical no, 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 factors no, no, no. make the airway more difficult than in adults. Physiological factors add to the trouble, the neonatal airway is more prone to inspiratory collapse, the lower FRC and much higher oxygen consumption makes the neonates really prone to hypoxemia. And if it's a neonate, that to a premature, it per se is a difficult airway. And if they are syndromic, it just adds to the problem and an inadequately or inaccurately managed airway rapidly leads to a high incidence of adverse effects. Now, if the baby is syndromic in addition, those syndromes which have associated airway problems make the management even more difficult. There are well-known abnormalities seen in certain anatomical, uh, certain congenital uh, abnormalities which are associated with the airway. They could range from fusion of the cervical vertebrae to features such as retrognathia, micrognathia, or mandibular hypoplasia seen in conditions such as the treacher Collins syndrome. So in literature, there is a very extensive list of these syndromes which are associated with airway features. And when encountered, they can make airway management in these babies, which are anyway high risk for anesthesia management, really difficult. We've again focused on how we go about the assessment of these children. We need to know a focused history and nowhere else is history more important than in the evaluation of a preterm neonate. The most important information about the airway can be got from the history. Usually it's the mother or the father or occasionally a relative who gives the history. And we must be very careful that we are getting the accurate history from this caregiver. Take a history of the details of birth whether the child had a normal birth, was it a preterm, was it a term, was it a cesarean delivery? Were there any respiratory events after birth? Will the chi child cry immediately after birth? Have there been any respiratory events, any apneic episodes, any evidence of decreased muscle tone, any other airway event at the time of birth or after the birth? Find out from the caregiver the position in which the child is most comfortable in the mother's lap. Does he lie prone? Does he lie on his side? Is he comfortable in the supine position? Normally, cough in children is indicative of a respiratory illness. But if on history you elicit a condition that cough is occurring without evidence of any other respiratory illness, it can indicate an airway abnormality such as subglottic stenosis. Take a detailed history of feeding and connect it to any evidence of respiratory distress. Is there any choking, coughing, vomiting, or drooling that occurs when the mother feeds the baby? This can give you vital information about the airway. Take a detailed history on phonation and cough. 
Any hoarseness or diminished cry can indicate laryngomalacia. An abnormal quality of voice can be indicative of unilateral vocal cord paralysis. Take a history of any previous intervention that the child has had. Has there been any ICU admission? Was the child ever on oxygen support? If any records are available, do examine them minutely. The focused history should be followed by a focused general physical examination as we have been emphasizing. One look at the child will tell you whether the child has any airway issue or not. The activity level of the child, the respiratory rate, the breathing pattern will tell you. The sounds that the child is making during respiration is indicative of trouble. What is the posture the child lies down in? What is the color? Is there any evidence of decreased circulation? The cry and speech of the child, the evidence of use of accessory muscles, nasal flaring will give you an idea of the respiratory distress that the child might have because of airway issues. Is there any mouth breathing? Is there any drooling that is happening? All this focused general physical examination can actually raise a red flag and help you identify airway issues. Take a look at this small video. This is a child who has bilateral coanon atresia, and you can appreciate this nasal twang of the child's cry, which just on one look indicates that the child has some airway issues. Take a look at this child and see how severely distressed the child is. And just one look at the child will tell you that all is not well. When you have done a physical examination, always, always examine the child from the side. The head and the facial symmetry should be seen both from the front and from the side. Evaluate the chin. Look for presence of any dysmorphic features. It is important to see the chin and the face from the side because evidence says that hypoplastic chin or micrognathia is a very good indicator of a difficult airway in a neonate, even in the absence of known congenital malformations. This should be followed by a focus airway examination. We've been talking about the line of sight examination, which is actually a very organized and systematic way of examining the airway from one end to the other without actually focusing on formulae and mnemonics to remember the difficult airway algorithm. There are certain trips and tricks which every anesthesiologist dealing with babies has up his sleeve to make examination in children simple. The children will not cooperate to your clinical examination, but just making the baby cry in the mother's arm can help him open his mouth and you can take a big deep look inside to examine the cavity of the mouth. The nasal apertures can be examined. This is followed by the mala region and the cheeks. Then if the child has opened his mouth, you can examine the oral cavity, take a good look at the size of the tongue, take a look at the mouth, the pharynx, and examine the palate. If the child has opened his mouth, obviously you'll be able to examine for inter-incisor gap and finally examine for the mobility of the mandible because poor mobility of the mandible will mean that you will not be able to anteriorly lift the jaw. Do examine the distance between the tragus and the nares in small babies. This is followed by examination of the head and neck range of movements. Difficulty in visualizing the glottic opening can be indicated by limited head and neck range of movements. Limited neck mobility is a classic feature of certain deformities which involve the airway, such as the Kleppel-Field syndrome. This examination should be followed by a detailed examination of the neck for any gross tracheal deviation for neck swellings and deformity. Now, usually cricothyroid membrane is not part of routine airway examination, but AMF algorithm insists and teaches you that examination and palpation of the cricothyroid membrane should be a part of routine airway examination, even in neonates, because clinical experience and literature have both shown that inability to identify and palpate the cricothyroid membrane in times of stress can actually lead to poorer outcomes. Do we need any, any other investigations in such babies to evaluate the airway further? Yes, probably if all the information which you need has not already been got by doing a physical examination and a focused airway examination. 
If it is not visible, then probably you need detailed examination to get to know the airway problems. This is usually a part of the surgical uh, planning and also helps in better outcomes related to the airway. Look at this child on the right-hand side. This picture is courtesy uh, a resident from Ames Jodhpur. This is a meningomyloceal coming out of the anterior floor of the mouth and the skull. Now, to evaluate this, the surgeons have already done a detailed uh, a CT scan and uh, other radiographic, radiographic examination, which tells you what part of the airway is involved. These days, sophisticated 3D printed models can be made available after detailed radiological examination to help you evaluate the airway in syndromic babies. Ultrasound is another investigation which is available these days with us at the bedside, completely non-invasive, which will give you valuable information about the upper airway of the child. Sometimes you may go ahead and do a scopy for evaluation of the airway. Even in neonates, a check scopy can be done under local anesthesia sometimes to give you a very dynamic evaluation of the upper airway. Now, once you have done all this examination and assessment, identify which part of the airway is difficult. Now, difficult airway is a very generic term. If we need to be more specific, we need to identify what part of the airway is exactly difficult. And once we've done that, we will be able to categorize the problem areas of airway management into available areas, difficult areas, and impossible areas. The focus here is on the difficult areas because these are the ones which are optimizable within your resource set in, in your institution. The next after evaluation of patient is evaluation of the equipment and procedure. Dr. Nishant has also talked about it, that we do an assessment of the resources of the surgical requirements and of the airway manager's mindset as to what our requirements are, which will influence the management plan of the baby. Manpower is very important in dealing with preterm neonates with a deformed airway. All the people who are around to help you, do they have experience in dealing with deformed airways of small babies? Do they have the required knowledge and skills? Do you have expert ENT help available for doing a pediatric tracheostomy that also in a preterm low birth weight baby with a deformed airway? Not everybody's uh, cup of tea. Never ever take a leap of faith. Always make sure that expert help and equipment is available. Oxygenation, we've been emphasizing through the talks in the evening. It's very, very important to plan this part to make sure that your management of the airway leads to a good outcome. You must know your equipment, particularly in smaller preterm babies. If you look at the picture on the right hand side, this is a baby on my OT table who was just 750 grams. He's just as small as the palm of my hand. Do we have the equipment for him? I come from a tertiary care pediatric hospital, but even we do not have equipment to deal with these kind of preterm babies. The smallest face mask that I had covered his entire face. The laryngoscope, which was available in the theater, the smallest laryngoscope filled his entire mouth and two number endotracheal tube was hard to find. So it's very, very important when dealing with smaller babies to find out if you have the required equipment to deal with them. What is the smallest size of bronchoscope that you have? Which size endotracheal tube can be railroaded over that? And will that assembly pass through the very small nostril of a baby who's barely one or 1.5 kg? besides the resuscitative equipment, as well as monitoring equipment should also be available, tailored to your very, very small neonatal patient. There is ample evidence available in literature that not only the expertise, but the equipment also has a very important role to play in the outcome. And equipment deficiency, particularly for preterm neonates, is a sad reality. Your anesthesia trolley which you prepare for the difficult airway should be tailored to the size of your baby. You can't have devices for a 3.5, 4 or 5 kg baby when the neonate on your table is barely 900 grams. Once we've done with the knowledge of the patient as well as the equipment, we come to knowledge of our procedure. 
And there are certain questions which we need to answer when we are planning the airway of a small baby. Do we prep pre-medicate? Do we do inhalational or intravenous induction? Should the baby be kept on spontaneous ventilation or should he be paralyzed? And finally, how do we go about the oxygenation in that baby? We will go through these questions as I present a summary case for your uh, uh, patient listening. Now, this is a baby who was presented to us, came to our theater. Uh, he's a diagnosed case of Pierre Robin sequence, a 2 kg male baby at 34 weeks of gestation. Does he have a difficult airway? Yes, absolutely he does. But what made the airway more nightmarish for us was that the baby who was posted for mandibular distraction came to us on the day of the third, uh, OT after multiple attempts at intubation, making his airway even more difficult. When we went through this procedure of focused history examination and airway examination, we came across these findings. He was preterm 34 weeks, 2 kg, with micrognathia, severe glossoptosis, cleft palate, who was admitted in NICU, was terribly oxygen dependent, had a very high respiratory rate and obvious signs of respiratory distress. Would we want some more investigations in this baby? Not for the evaluation of the airway because that would anyway require general anesthesia, but yes, he went through the entire blood profile as well as a detailed cardiac examination was done to rule out any other congenital cardiac abnormality. As for the grid you are already familiar with, when we did a line of sight examination, we identified which were the areas which were difficult in this baby. Since we had not yet peeped into the airway, we didn't know if any of them would actually be impossible or not. We then examined the non-patient factors and actually identified whether all the equipment that we would need for this baby were present in the theater or not. We asked for extra help. In fact, another consultant who was dealing routinely with pediatric airway was asked to be present in the theater. We asked our ENT team who was proficient at doing neonatal uh, tracheostomies to be ready in the theater. We tried to arrange for all the equipment and had a dry run of the equipment before we started. When the surgical requirements were licked into, the surgeon told us that was for this mandibular distraction, we only needed oral intubation and nasal intubation was not a requirement. When we examined the airway manager's mindset, we all knew we were all on the same page that if required, we could use a supraglottic device as a definitive conduit for intubation in this child. Let's go through our anesthesia plan. Do we need to pre-medicate this baby? Usually, neonates do not require pre-medication as other older pediatric patients. And definitely, a preterm syndromic baby with respiratory distress and a deformed airway definitely does not. Yes, an IV cannula should be there. It's mandatory if it's not there before your baby comes into the theater. Do they need anesthesia? Definitely, yes. Awake techniques are usually are preferred for all adult patients with such deformed airways, but babies will not cooperate with you, definitely not neonates, and GA becomes the only option. When you're giving GA, what should you go for? IV, inhalational, or a combo? It's difficult to answer this question because one size fits all approach does not work. It depends on the equipment, on the expertise and on the nature of the difficult airway, which will actually decide your technique of anesthesia and eventually your method of taking access to the airway. Since inhalational anesthesia is very popular technique in children, I wish to bring out these few caveats related to inhalational anesthesia. Anesthetic induction will definitely be prolonged in a baby where airway obstruction is occurring, particularly when you have omitted nitrous oxide. Moreover, we've all been harping about paraoxygenation. Oxygen flowing at high rates through the upper airway will definitely dilute the anesthetic agent. And if you're only depending on the anesthetic agent delivered inhalationally, you will never achieve an adequate deep plane of anesthesia. Moreover, Whenever you remove the mask for any intervention, your plane of anesthesia will become lighter and that is something you don't want. So a combined IV and inhalational anesthetic technique that avoids a light plane of anesthesia, even in smaller babies is to be desired. Few more questions before we go on to the actual plan. 
Topicalization required in small babies with deformed airways. If you're planning a nasal fiber optic, yes, definitely less. You will have a much easier run if you have some form of topicalization. Usually you can catch hold of the baby, put it in the mother's lap, ask the mother to hold the nebulizer and give some amount of nebulization of local anesthetic. Since we were planning an intubation through the oral route, the only preparation we did was for the nostril. We put a local anesthetic along with the vasoconstrictor to make sure that the nostril was well prepared. But whenever you are giving any local anesthetic to small preterm babies, make sure you keep in mind the maximum dose of local anesthetic that can be delivered. We had an oxygenation plan in C2. The oxygenation for difficult airway in syndromic babies can range from nasal prongs to HFNOs to oxygen circuits providing 100% oxygen. We selected nasal trumpet, which we will go through as we see the case being unfolded. What was the airway access plan for us? We had the ENT team in the OT ready for a tracheostomy because cricothyroidotomy as an emergency access in a preterm baby is absolutely not an option. Emergence plan, we never planned to extubate the trachea of this baby. He was to be shifted back to NICU intubated for elective ventilation. So how did we go about our anesthesia? As we've said, general anesthesia, once the child came into the OT, he had an IV line in C2. We gave the required amount of glycopyrrolate in the recommended doses as an anti -silagogue. It's a good thing to do this, not only to dry the airway, but it prevents any bradycardia that may occur because of the airway instrumentation that you are going to undertake. We started with IV induction and gave small amounts of fentanyl in the dose of one microgram per kg. So total two mics of fentanyl was given in two dosages, one mic followed by another mic, so that we could pre preserve spontaneous respiration. This was not enough and the baby was still awake. So we followed it up with two milligrams of ketamine delivered IV. I started mask ventilation thereafter because the tongue was very large and there was a lot of edema because of the repeated intubation attempts which had taken place in the baby prior to being brought to the theater, I inserted an OPA and continued mask ventilation, which unfortunately was not very good. We decided to keep the child on spontaneous ventilation. Because we were planning instrumentation, we decided now to put in a nasal trumpet this was connected to the anesthesia circuit through which we delivered supplemental anesthetic agents that is sevoflurane along with oxygen. We deepened the plane of anesthesia and thereby now after the nasal trumpet was in place, I first attempted video laryngoscopy. However, the airway was extremely difficult and video laryngoscopy did not lead us anywhere we could hardly see anything as this video will show you. You can see the edge of the nasopharyngeal airway that is delivering oxygen as well as inhalational anesthetic agents. But the video laryngoscopy, it was a Cormac and Lehan grade four and we just could not see anything. So now we had to jump on to plan B. The plan B, was to insert an oral supraglottic device. We decided on a size one eye gel. We connected the anesthesia circuit through this eye gel and started delivering oxygen and anesthetic agents through the eye gel and plan to do now a fiber optic guided intubation through the eye gel. Therefore, once the circuit would be disconnected, the plane of anesthesia would become lighter again. So we supplemented the uh, IV agents and gave him another dose of two milligrams of ketamine. Thereby, we proceeded to do a fiber optic intubation and through the supraglottic device.
This is introduction of the supraglottic device. Once the device has been inserted, we removed the uh, uh, nasal trumpet. This is the final intubation through the supraglottic device. As you can see, this is actually not the same baby. This is just to demonstrate how we actually did an intubation through the supraglottic device. This is a size three fibroscope of Carl Storrs. We've just put the endotracheal tube in, used another smaller endotracheal tube to railroad and bring the eye gel out. Once the eye gel is brought out, the circuit is connected to the endotracheal tube. The ventilation is checked and ETCO2 confirmed. Once the endotracheal tube was in situ, this is the time we gave the child muscle relaxants, secured the endotracheal tube, did a throat packing, sent out a little prayer to God, thanked him, and finally handed the baby over to the surgeons for their surgical procedure. So to summarize, syndromic neonates with craniofacial abnormalities are a real challenge in terms of airway management. Airway needs to be focused, as already told you, by a focused history, GPE, as well as line of sight airway assessment. And thereafter, the problems of airway management can be categorized as available, difficult, or impossible. It's very important to take stock of the non-patient factors if you want to optimize the outcome of your airway management. Particularly in children that also small babies, neonates with deformed airways, it's very important to have experience with the equipment and a dry run is very important to make sure that everything runs well and according to plan. It is a good thing to have routine practice of these procedures in times which are not related to the stressful condition that is in cold times so that in war times you do not have any difficulty. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Ranju. That was great and uh, good that you shared this case and uh, took us all the way uh, using another patient and uh, you showed the skills that are needed for such a patient. So, uh, so to uh, summarize what we have done today, uh, So oh, thanks to all the speakers and uh, we'll take the question once we summarize what we have done today. So talked about the uh, uniform approach all of you have used and shown us how to go about that. Uh, the best, the, the most important thing all the speakers have said is that we can uh, know about the patient through focused history, general examination, and line of sight airway examination. However, we uh, all will have to uh, know, should have the knowledge about the set of patients that we are talking about, whether it was parturient or the morbidly obese or the C-spine unstable, unstable or the low birth weight syndromic neonate. The, the anatomical features which were special to these cases were different and uh, they talked about it in detail and the physiological changes which these features will cause in that patient have to be kept in mind when we plan our uh, uh, you know, uh, airway management. And finally, uh, situational uh, things can add to the woes and uh, these are especially relevant to the parturient who are mostly managed in the ER, which uh, uh, Dr. Nidhi spoke in detail about. And of course, once we have done all that, only then we'll be able to fill this grid uh, nicely and properly. And uh, as uh, the, uh, all the speakers said, it is the difficult areas which are optimizable if you have the kind of resources or the skill level or the knowledge level that will make all the difference between a, 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 a good outcome or a wonderful outcome or a bad outcome in an airway management scenario. As far as the equipment and uh, procedures are concerned, the skills, the skill set that you must have, 
um, if you if you look at it, you know, uh, they have all spoken about it, uh, mostly oxygenation and the equipment and the skills needed in various, all these four scenarios. And they have also summarized the, the skill sets that they, they, they should have, the special equipment and the uh, special skills, and of course, keeping in mind the surgical requirement. So this summarizes all the four cases and uh, all these inputs are from these uh, speakers only. And finally, one must understand, which uh, Ranju just said in our uh, summary slide, that skills are finite. There are not too many skills that we are all using. They have used almost similar kind of skills, but they, uh, the, the practice has to be infinite and you should do it in four situations when, when you are not dealing with actually the difficult uh, cases. So whether it is just the knowledge of anatomy and to the various methods of oxygenation to the, uh, the art of counseling, you know, talking to the patient while you are performing your, uh, your thing, you know, while you are performing your thing. So talking to the patient, uh, then the art of topicalization, the, the dose of local anesthetics that you need to know, the various new equipment which are on the, on, on the ground, which are there. Then optimizing the mass ventilation, you know, the, the ventilation part, whatever tricks you have up your sleeve. You, know, you have to keep on practicing these day in, day out. Not that only when a difficult difficulty occurs, you should do it. Now, the supraglottic airway are, are the second big saviors and because they help in ventilation. So, you should know whether you have been able to do it properly. So, now using SAD is one thing. Just shoving it in is one thing. But to perform the small tests which are there day in, day out, bubble test or, or a brimacom bounce test or a placement of a uh, nasal gastric tube through it or the test of double minute ventilation or checking the oropharyngeal leak pressures. All these things have to be done on daily basis. Only then you will be, become smart enough to be working in those scenarios. So optimization of laryngoscopy, whether it is a proper use of the OELM, optimal external laryngeal manipulation or learning how to put in a bougie uh, in, a, in a mannequin, uh, right? Uh, having the uh, the uh, Cormac and Lehane grade, grade, which is 2B or 3, or using a video laryngoscope properly, uh, or all kinds of video laryngoscopes are available. So master a couple of them and know how to use the stillet along with that or a bougie as uh, Nishant told you in his presentation. Right? So then follow it up with... <clears throat> Follow it up with uh, knowing the the fiberscopy. The you know what does what you learn it. This is a, a video which we made uh, with the Munisha long time back. Whether to put in a nasopharyngeal uh, nasotracheal intubation, fiber optic guided, or an oral intubation. How to open the airway? How to place the tube? You we must know about that. And at the same time, you should know how to do fiberscopy through. Uh, a supraglottic device in place. That again has been touched by all the speakers. That, that can be very handy uh, in uh, accessing the airway. So, uh, and finally, you will, you will, you should be, you should keep on practicing the art of uh, front of neck access, emergency front of neck access, and also the art of extubation, putting in an air, uh, the the uh, airway exchange catheter and know that how long you can place it and how safe it can be and how easy it makes your life. So all in all, patient factors, the non-patient factors and your skill set, you know, that is what uh, will uh, make you succeed in all kinds of airway difficulties. And the guiding principle still remains that intubation looks the most glamorous, but this is the least important. More important is ventilation, whether through bag and mask or through supraglottic airway device, but the, but the elixir being oxygenation. And once you realize that even when you can't ventilate, you can still oxygenate through apnea oxygenation, you will really become the smartest of the airway managers. And as far as the, as far as the skill uh, thing is concerned, that also has to be learned. And 
And if you if you use this uniform approach that we were all talking about, it makes it easy to make the decision. The decision making is itself a great skill, which you can master using this uniform approach. So I thank all the speakers who, uh, who have participated in today's webinar. And I also thank from our side, from the entire team of AMF and the, these five people who are participating in this webinar to the whole team of ICA for giving us this great opportunity to uh, interact with the, all of you. Yes, uh, yes, any, sir. Any questions in the chat box? Uh, yes, yeah, sir. There so, is a couple yes, of sir, them. One odd uh, questions, yeah. Uh, what will be, what will happen to resistance of airway when baby is spontaneously breathing with all gadgets inside? <clears throat> all gadgets inside, I, I am not able to get the answer, uh, get, uh, understand the uh, question. Uh, because uh, the gadgets which Dr. Ranju talked about were those who which were making the airway patent. Am I right, Ranju? Yes, sir. Can so all the gadgets can... which they're talking about are the actual ones which are keeping the airway open and allowing oxygenation. So have you answered the question? Yes, sir. The gadgets okay. which they're talking about are actually the ones which are keeping the airway open and allowing oxygenation. Okay. So, so uh, I don't think that is a fair trade-off. Uh, whatever resistance is there is actually uh, uh, after the airway is open and oxygenation is taking place. So I don't think uh, we need to trade this off for uh, 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 anything else. There is another one. If mask ventilation is adequate, I've and answered that, sir. No difficulty in ventilation. You can if mask ventilation okay. is adequate and you are sure that it's a functional cause or even anything else and mask ventilation can be done and you're very sure, you can please go ahead and give the relaxant. It depends yeah. on your area of expertise. If you're good at handling the airway and confident, yes, you can go ahead. It will probably make your intubation much simpler, uh, the laryngoscopy and intubation simpler. But if there was something like we faced, we were not able to ventilate the child well. And to be very honest, every time he was not spontaneously breathing, he would decide. In those conditions, I would be a little careful, but otherwise you can go ahead and give a relaxant if it's the mask ventilation uh, you are good at. And you can do it, you can please go ahead and give it. So I think we are running out of time. We, I was told that 8.50 was the latest that we could go on to. So Dr. Baljeet, uh, over yeah. to you. Thank you once again for uh, uh, this uh, whole session. And uh, thank, uh, uh, thank you so much for uh, an excellent moderation, I must say that. And of course, uh, you know, uh, the speakers have to be thanked, especially for excellent presentations, very lucid presentations. And uh, what I can see is that the standout messages, uh, there are certain standout messages. One, of course, is, you know, what your aid, aid management foundation highlights, know your patient, know your equipment, and know your technique. I think this is a very, very important message that everybody should carry home. The second, of course, is the line of sight approach, which again is uh, uh, highlighted by uh, by nearly all the speakers. And Dr. Manisha, I mean, if you allow me uh, one or two points about each, uh, Dr. Kesh, uh, she highlighted the role of ramp position, which is uh, very uh, well done. Uh, apart from that, she uh, managed uh, mentioned about pre and peroxygen, the role of pre and uh, peroxygenation of the patient, backup plan for oxygenation just in case it doesn't work out. And then uh, the approach that she said uh, for awake intubation, uh, facing the patient approach, which she, uh, you know, uh, is, uh, presented a small video also. I think that was another alternative approach which uh, one can adopt. And uh, with regard to the management of the syndromic patient, uh, you know, the excellent presentation again. Uh, uh, the highlight of this was the focus history, focus general physical examination of the patient, and palpating the ketothyroid membrane. I think this is a very important uh, uh, takeaway. Uh, and of course, uh, line of sight management as well. And having the ENT surgeon uh, to be ready there just in case, uh, uh, you know, you need to have uh, a, a surgical airway in place. Uh, besides that, uh, uh, you also mentioned about, you know, all these devices that we have mentioned. Uh, you know, one should be familiar with these devices. Uh, like, I mean, if you have fiber optic bronchoscope and you like to use it on a patient who has a difficult airway, probably it's not going to help you out. Until unless you are familiar with the device on normal patients and you have done it few times, only then you should attempt the same equipment uh, for a situation which is really different. I think that was another very, very important takeaway 
uh, from from the presentation. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Case, once again, for the excellent moderation. And of course, to the wonderful speakers, all the four speakers, Dr. Nidhi Bhatia, Dr. Manisha Agarwal, uh, Dr. Nishant Sahai, and Dr. Anju Singh, excellent speakers. And uh, we certainly look forward to having uh, all the speakers along with the moderator once again sometime in the platform of ICA sometime later. Uh, later thank on. Thank you. And we'd love to be part of this. I think all of us would be. Yes, sir. Absolutely. And on behalf of uh, the mm -hmm. ICA, my own behalf, and uh, behalf of Dr. Aza Krishnan, the academic coordinator, and of Sunish, mm -hmm. I thank you once again profusely. Mm -hmm. And we also thank Glennard uh, uh, for their uh, you know uh, support for presentation for for uh, the conduct of these webinars. Thank you.